And I'm going to run, run you through an example of the website that IWS is meaning for us. Now, here you can see we've got both of our cameras. And here's our chat room. This is where viewers can actually interact with each other. And we're going to pull in a little bit here. Here's camera two. This is the view looking straight down. And if you click on it, you can get a full screen view. And notice the grass there. <laughs> Just thinking about a month ago. A long time ago. Yeah, now the grass, if you looked at it recently, it's. Yeah. But this is the PTC view, and this is the view that changes. This is just a nice open view. But yeah, we've got a great system. So we've had a couple storms roll in since we've installed this system. And at this point, we're pretty sure that it's going to survive, although we are having trouble currently with it. We, we may have had some lightning damage this past storm series, and, but it seems like it's going to be an easy fix. But the, we were able to install this in September, late September, and we've had lots of time to learn how to drive the PTZ, and it's allowed us to make some interesting observations. Um, we've had the adults check in, both of them actually, and we can tell that there are adults from last year because the female, she has a very noticeable, they call it a wonky feather. I don't know how that, that word came around, but she's got her wonky feather, so everybody was very excited when she showed back up, and, and she's also been pulling some of that grass on occasion, doing a little bit of gardening, and they've brought in a few sticks. But we've also had other winged visitors. Cooper's Hawk, this was great. We had a 20-minute like a period where we could zoom in, you could zoom in all the way and just fill the frame with this, this bird's it's amazing the quality we get. We had a Merlin. We see Merlin up there, and also we've had ravens. But during the installation of the system, we made a kind of interesting observation. It took two days to get the system up. And one of the last things that was done was the mounting of the pan tilt zoom camera. So I left the camera itself laying on the nest. When I came back in the morning, I found this critter up there. <laughs> and that's a chorus frog. That's a northern Pacific chorus frog. They are, they're common around here. And if you live somewhere near the bottoms, they might keep you up at night. They're very noisy. But we, um, this, is, uh, this is the day of the installation. Wow. Is that the new feather? So we're, we're wondering, you know, well, is there just this guy? How did he find this nest? How did he climb the trunk? This nest is over 100 feet up. So it was, it was an, interest, an interesting observation. So, um, you know, we thought about that. And then one of the other advantages of our, our camera system is it, it's able to see at night. And this is imagery taken at night. Now, when the IR lights, the infrared lights kick in, it goes to a black and white image, and that's we were amazed at all the life. The, the, the nest is teeming with life. Again, we were able to see, there's the little frog, and it was like up to four or five of his buddies that were up there <laughs> at a time. And these frogs, they seem to have their own little spots where they would come out every night. It was, behavior was very patterned. We also saw at least two species of bat, Lots of flying insects, moths and, and such. It looked like we were seeing uh, termites in their wing face. Uh, big beetles, beetles the size of your thumb, like scary big beetles. <laughs> yeah, and, and big crickets, like the crickets with legs. Yeah, just millipedes, centipedes, all kinds of strange wildlife. And it, the night times were alive on the, the warm fall evenings when it was moist. But the frogs, I was really excited. <laughs> and if you look here, there's one, there's two, and they don't really interact too much with each other. They sort of keep their, and they see this guy with the beetle? They're just sitting right there, and the beetle's looking at him, and they're like, ah, oh, you're too big to eat, so I'll let you, I'll let you stay there. <laughs> but our pan tilt zoom, this image right here was taken with the PTZ camera, it's about 10 feet away. 
We pulled in pitch dark. We can't see the light, the camera can. And we were able just to watch the behavior of this animal in which shine. It's quite fascinating. So this, seeing this, we, we got to thinking, you know, these are unique observations. People who study this frog, this kind of observation, they've never been made before. This behavior is new to science. So we decided, hey, we've got all these very interested people in the HBE community that it's off-season, we don't have eagles, and they were very interested in this frog. And so we decided to create this activity called Frog Watch, and we're collecting data. <coughs> So here, I'm going to run you through our Frog Watch online submission form. Now that view was camera two. That's what we use for a frog. You can look, and this is a form, and I'm running through here. You pick the date. It's real simple. The date, and this is time. Oh, that's your initials. Each person who participates gets their own three-letter initials. And then you pick the time. And we have to tell people to be very careful because we want you to get the right time. That's important. So you go through, you fill this out. Every five minutes, people can fill out a form. And it's, it's a real simple data form. Data collection is not complicated at all. You're, it's basically, where are you seeing a frog if you're seeing frogs? Is there, are there insects active on the nest? Is it windy? Is it raining? Just simple, simple data. We can get more detailed weather data from online sources. So we're really just getting people engaged and it's amazing the participation we've had here. This little map down here is used to identify where the frogs were observed. So an example, if a frog was observed in the top of the nest, that's called top outer. The there to describe where it went. So top outer to left outer would be where a frog would maybe move. And then you put your notes in there. And you hit submit. And it'll refresh in a minute, in every five minutes people were doing these forms. Now, when, when Sandra and I put this together, we didn't know how much participation we would have. But we, so far, have collected over 1,700 wow. survey forms. Wow. People love it. They just are, <laughs> they're looking for the frogs. And, and we, we're not seeing a lot of frog activity now because we think it's because of the cold. And then also, these animals need water to breed. So you're, you start, you're hearing the frogs chirping now. They're giving their calls on the ground, so we think that they're going to go down and go breathe. But interestingly, just uh, on December 26, after not seeing frogs for quite a while, there was an observation made. And it was at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we have this video footage archived. I went back and checked it. One of the viewers, one of the frog surveyors, caught this, this most recent frog activity, it was less than two seconds. I'm amazed at the, the quality of their citizen scientists. They, they're into it, and it's, it's amazing the data that they've collected. Right. And Sam's going to wrap up with their outreach education and a little bit more about citizen science. So it was really amazing as we started <coughs> this whole process. Um, I have to say, we thought we'd have you know a few local people checking into the cam, and, and we'd have like this small little community, and it'd just be kind of a neat way to introduce this to a few people. <clears throat> Thousands and millions of people later, <laughs> uh, we have this APE community, and they're very motivated, very motivated, and they're always like, "How can we help? How can we help?" So uh, we had the moderators that were now trained, and uh, and. Really, the whole community ended up having training and in, increased the skill set. And, and everybody had something to bring to the project. Somebody had this knowledge. Somebody, had, somebody else may have had time in the middle of the day. And somebody else had time late in the evening. And it was amazing the discussions that would be happening on how to make things work. That chart that you saw uh, that divided up the nest, that chart was developed by the HPE community through discussion. And we would just pipe in a little bit, what do you think about, and then the discussion would continue. And so that's just really something that's um, really amazing. Uh, education, priority. And so we're going to continue to uh, try and work on getting some kind of curriculum to bring to the teachers so that they can do a better job or, or have it be easier for them. 
Uh, this last year, we had teachers come in and, and ask questions, and they would post the answers uh, at school. And then we also had, of course, the uh, Navy the Eaglet uh, project. So we went in and gave them a, a little award for doing that. So we're going to continue to um, be a classroom resource and try to engage students. But we also uh, want to not forget everyone else. And we'd like to continue to develop citizen science projects for all ages. Uh, we're planning on working with local scientists and maximize the potential that we have with this PTZ camera. So uh, to engage the HPE community, we're soon going to have uh, a guess the age of the nest tree. Jim went and poured the tree, and Allison Carroll, an HSU dendrochronologist, went and actually counted all the rings, and we know how old that tree is, and it matches up with history in the area, and that's really exciting. And so people will learn about the process of aging the trees and the history of the area. And then we also have Marie Antoine, an HSU lecturer. She is a lichenologist, and she is going to help us identify the different kinds of lichens on the tree and in turn educate the public about lichen and their role. So there's more to come, and we're constantly thinking of ideas. And, and generally, the ideas and how much we get done are limited more by time than anything else. So we have this citizen science project already going, the Frog Watch, and we're hoping to expand the data collection. Um, we're going to publish a note in journal. Um, the fact that frogs, these frogs are found this high up in a tree is actually not known. It's only the second observation of a tree frog way up there. And if you think about it, it's mostly because we're not, like, Jim doesn't spend the night up in the tree, <laughs> right? So then we just don't have the opportunity to see them. But this camera gives us that opportunity, and so we really do need to share that with the scientific community as well as the public. We're hoping to be able to uh, come up with something that we, we're calling trunk watch to see if we can see them going up and down the trunk, perhaps. We don't know the timing of when they do that, if they do it once or twice a year when they're breeding. They have to breed in a pond, right? So are they going down to breed in the pond and then going back up in the tree? Are they hanging out in the tree? Do they not realize they're not by a pond anymore? We have no clue. So this is all going to be a discovery process with the whole HPE community along with us scientists going along with the ride. So, and then we also hope, uh, now that we have this online form um, <clears throat> developed and we know how to use it and we realize how effective it can be, we're hoping to expand it to other projects. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> again, fundraising is not the primary objective of the CAM, and it's motivated from within the community. So it's whatever the community comes up with and deems that they want. Uh, the new equipment was priority for uh, the 2013, and uh, we're hopeful that outreach and education will likely dominate any fundraising in 2014. The 2013 funds were used for the new equipment, which Jim showed you, um, the Citizen Science um, Project, and also to support the Humboldt Wildlife Care Center Raptor Education Program. We hope to continue a partnership with IWS. They're a great organization to work with and have a depth of background with eagles and cams that is um, amazing. And we're going to continue to look for other opportunities, including uh, possible additional cameras in the area. And of course, with such a project, with all volunteers, there's always a lot of thank you. First and foremost, the landowner who uh, gave us the opportunity to begin with and allows us to descend on the property with all of our equipment and things to do. Um, as some of you know, the CAM is currently down. The landowner has been working for the last two days to try to get the networking back up. Um, and they really don't have to do that. They choose to do that. And we're very appreciative of that. Uh, Institute for Wildlife Studies, Humboldt Wildlife Care Center, um, Sequoia Park Zoo, the chat moderators, the Facebook administrators, project volunteers, the community, of course. And so it really does take a village to make a successful CAM. Uh, on the, we had 11 moderators that worked last year um, to keep the chat up basically from dawn till dusk, sometimes longer. Um, and then we had other projects. They had Gar Salon with the banding, Peter Sharp with all his expertise in the CAM, Linda Parkinson and Diane Dickinson wrote the grant, 
Uh, Mary Maloney uh, does the Raptor Education Program, and we're hoping to work with them on expanding that and including Eagles <clears throat> more readily. Um, Giacomo is uh, Jim's climbing partner and has always been there to help him with that. Megan started the Cafe Press site. Glenda <clears throat> was the head of the Fledge Party. Debbie did the summary video that you saw and was a huge um, lead, leader for the Frog Watch at the community level. And of course, the whole entire community that watches and participates <coughs> in all of that. So to all of these people, a very special thank you. And this is basically my motto <clears throat> for this project. And it is, by making a connection with wildlife through understanding and empathy, that people will consider their needs when making everyday decisions. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm. So we can do Q and A. Go for it. <laughs> um, during this past nesting season. Um, was the data collected as to what they ate? How many we, of this, how many of that? Yeah, we did to some level. Um, the quality of the camera was not good enough to always be able to tell what species was being brought, but we did have some online uh, submission on the Facebook page where people could say, hey, I saw a bird brought in on this day, I saw whatever they would see, and they would submit that. But we're hoping to expand that to um, through the Zeta board and possibly even through one of those online forums so that we can get more detailed data about what the <coughs> diet is of these eagles here on the bay. Because the diet of eagles changes depending on where they live. They're very opportunistic. Are any of the other moderators present? Would they identify themselves? Uh, one moderator is here, Brian. Uh, Brian. 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 <laughs> 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 on Facebook today that we uh, state our chat name. So I'm Sandra Dragon, and that's partly for my love of dragonflies, and Jim is True Jimmy. <laughs> but oh, I'm Cliff Jimmy. I'm Bee Bruin. Bruin. Yeah. How high off the ground is the nest? It's about 100 feet, just over, yeah. And the tree itself is almost 120, but the upper section is dead. The nest itself sits on the lap or the highest live branches on the tree. Everything else above it is dead. This data board that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I take it it's online. Can any of the HB community get on that? And if yes. so, how? Uh, there is a link on the Facebook page, and I don't have it memorized. I'm sorry. Um, a, there's a link on the Facebook There is a page. link, yeah. and we'll make sure to uh, make that very prominent, especially as the begin to show up. But we'll have updates on there and there'll be ways to share photos and things like that for people that are not on Facebook. You can participate in the Zeta board. I mean, you can view the Zeta board information without having an online ID. But if you want to participate and add to it, it requires you to be part of the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on Re I'm part of the chat. Yeah, you have to register with the Zeta board. Oh, as well. So, okay. Yeah, but if you don't want to do that, you can still peek in and see what's going on with the rest of you. Um, what is the cost of a new camera setup with the computers and stuff? It's like it seems like a fabulous. Oh, it, yeah, it's they're spending. It's it's. I'm gonna say, I don't know, between six and eight thousand dollars in a new system. That but that includes a lot of stuff. This we had to recable the tree, the tree completely, new modems, new new computer, a whole new computer system just to make it work. This is, uh, we gave the community a price target. We said, well, we can put a new system in for this much, or this would be the, all the bells and whistles right here. Yeah. And they wanted the biggest and the best. <laughs> <laughs> the fundraising was amazing, what they were able to accomplish. So they have, we have one of the nicest systems out there. The high definition image that we can the images we can get out of the system are, are great. And they're allowing us to do things like frog watch at nighttime viewing. It's it's great. I it seems incredibly inexpensive to me, considering 
considering all the people that get to see it. And yeah. Mm -hmm. this thing. Well, the, the cost of this sort of technology has been going down rapidly over the last decade. A system like this, 10 years ago, it, it would not have been attainable. It, it just the cost of it. But it's less than half of what it may have been, maybe even like a third. Is it pretty universally disruptive to install a camera after birds have nested, or are there other species where that can be done? Or It depends on the camera. It's pretty much a no-no. Mm -hmm. But if you have a camera that was very, very discreet, mm -hmm. you could get away with it. And sometimes that's that's what happens because you can't always predict where a bird's going to nest. With eagles, it's easier because there's a giant stick nest that they use year after year. But in some species, no. You have to find their newly formed nest, and you have to put the camera on there. And that's usually those really tiny, the lipstick-style cameras <coughs> that they'll use. Yeah. And then you have to wait till they finish nesting that year and hope they come back the next year. I mean, there's always that. You can't go put a camera up during the nesting season or any <coughs> yeah. Not just an eagle thing. Any raptor. Or any nest, really. You're not allowed to disturb any any bird nests. Now, the banding that we do does occur during the nesting season, season obviously. Yeah. But we wait for the chicks to be old enough to where we know that the parents won't abandon them. Mm -hmm. And that's, usually they put, I would say, three weeks of effort into raising those chicks. It's going to take a lot for them to, to get scared off and leave the chicks behind. So we, we wait all the way until eight weeks before we put bands on. And the birds leave the nest typically around the 12 week stage. So we're waiting until late in nesting. And that has major permits involved. Yeah. Not yes. easily attained permits. <laughs> State and federal. Were there any concerns about the parents while you were going to do the banding effort? Uh, how did you know they wouldn't come and be really angry with you? <laughs> Visitation by the adults, which would be normal, just check-ins. But now is the time that we would expect to see them start to visit the nest more. So we have, right, it's, it's picked up a little bit. Yeah, I think, I, I've been out of country for a while, so Sandra might have. When was the last sighting of the adults? It was recent. I think over a week ago. But the cam's been down for three days. Yeah. So, um, and the landowners have been seeing them about a year. So... We do at least have that also, um, but we haven't seen any diligent nestorations begin. Um, and last year they were doing that right at the beginning of February when we went live. So we still have a little bit of time before we start to, you know, to be worried. I know everybody's anxious, including us. Um, but um, one of the first things that'll likely happen is. 
it's the female and the male, they'll, they'll come in and you'll see them start harvesting the grass, they'll start plucking it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing to see the, the grass, how it's grown up. We, we watched it in the fall, it's just little now, it's like a big giant bush of grass. <laughs> <laughs> so, I keep on thinking they'll just squash it down and lay the eggs on yeah. it. <laughs> and seeing that type of vegetation is, in a nest is, is quite common. It's, it's it is? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, as a nest gets older, there is a soil formation, and a lot of it is the adults are bringing in clumps of grass that they find on the beach, and there's, there's mineral soil in that, but also year after year, there's the prey remains and the other debris that gets in there, and it starts to create a nice organic soil. It's a perfect growing medium for plants. Yeah. I just have to say, I love the angle of this picture. Mm -hmm. The camera was on the bay. the one that's looking straight down at the nest. That's more of the whole nest reveal shot that we want to have. And that will allow us to see predators that are coming in, swooping by. The PTZ, we can move it around. But this, this year's angle is a bit different from last year's. And that's, we put up a bigger camera system. Last year we could work with a little tiny guy and we were able to nestle it right up underneath their perch branch and it was out of the way. But we could not put this year's camera system there. So we were able to figure out, using last year's data, where they were flying in from, and we, where we have the camera system now is in an area where we know they don't exit or enter into. So it's, a, it's the place where they don't go, and the cameras are situated back. It's, it's the perfect situation. But the view is, I don't know, it, it's, it's different. Some people will say maybe it's not as intimate, but we still we, I mean, we need to see. Yeah, we, I think people are going to be very surprised when the, the eggs are there, and when the adults are eating the eggs hatch, we're going to be able to just, it's going to be right there. We'll be able to zoom in and see the little chick picking out the egg. We've got that capability. This camera's amazing. <laughs> Identify all the prey. Yeah. Yeah. Be able to, yeah. Yeah, well, 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 I don't know, but some of it's pretty <laughs> 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 it's have up, a much easier time than yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right, that's right. We'll be able to yeah. into, to at least a group. Yes. Yeah, we'll see yes. certain types of fish or mammal and yeah. Right. Well, and every once in a while we had, last year we had like, what's that clump they brought in? You know, yes. it'd be like the big mystery. And the quality of the picture wasn't that good to be able to tell. It's like, what's that blurry thing? Right. So it now it's going to be a lot cleaner. Yeah. And we'll also be able to zoom into those things and go, oh, it's, you know, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. It'll be good. Oh, it'll be fun. And the two camera system, now we have redundancy. So yeah. just like this past storm, we may have one of the cameras to like the, who knows I don't think so I think it's just a hardware issue on the ground but yeah. if something goes wrong with one of the cameras we're not all yeah we got we got a backup so that's <laughs> another advantage a couple of times that I've seen the, the eagles take off uh, this year it's been beautiful because they just go down slide down and go off and then sometimes they'll turn around and come back. And yeah. it's, it was And that's one of the advantages beautiful. of the new view. That's, that's something right. that we couldn't see with the old view. Right. So there's going to be positives that's and negatives right. to any change, right. right? So. Well, they have the perching branches now, too. Yeah. And we can see the perching branches. And the fledging branch. branch. Yeah. 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 That would be, be, nice. be nice. There was a lot of activity last year that was just off camera. It was, uh, that was the, the battles between the ravens and the, the parents, you know, this yeah. violent clashes, and we were just kind of looking at the desk going, what's going on? Well, you're <laughs> <it's> <laughs> going. Now we're going to be looking around and seeing, and seeing it's really going to be a, a treat to be able just to see, to really peek into the life of these nesting eagles and their young. Yeah, I know, right. Yeah. Who, who nailed up the false, up the false limb? Yeah. <laughs> it was it was necessary. The, the was, top yeah. of the tree is just it's it's really in decay. Yeah, yeah we could lose the top. And that's another thing. No, it's, it's whole not camera. Kind of camera. camera. Yeah. 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 No, you're gonna yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we may have a few more years before uh, they are forced to use another nest site. We'll see. Yeah. You know, I have to say, as a as a biologist, I I've been monitoring 
raptor nests for years. And you do that with a scope from half a mile to a mile away, and you're zooming in, and you've got heat waves in the middle. <laughs> so you get to see, you know, you get to see, okay, there's two parents there, there might be a chick. You get to see that kind of stuff. You know, you might see some prey being brought in, but it's just, you know, a bird shadow with a clump in, right. their, in their talons. And that's all you get to see. And so as a biologist, for me, it's been so amazing to get the detail that you yeah. just never can get. And so as much as you guys all enjoy being able to see that, I'm, I, as a scientist, I'm just I'm soaking, I'm soaking it all in, yeah. soaking it in. And it's really changed the way that I look at the birds, even now when I'm doing other raptor surveys. Because I can kind of imagine a little more about what's going on and what I'm seeing in shadow. So that's really exciting. When you publish this stuff, will you let us know what journals? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there was a discussion last year that with this tree losing its viability, they may pick another place for yeah. it. Are there other viable trees on this landowner's property that they could choose? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. And, and nearby. The top of the tree could persist for some time, but if it is lost, that the nest would remain because it's on like the live branches, but they would lose their perching branches, and they really like to have good perching branches. But we'll, yeah, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. it. I think we still have some time with a good current tree, but you never know. I want to break in there real quick and just uh, offer that if people want to leave, feel free. And thank you.